Jesus. Can y'all hear me? No? Can y'all hear me? Dr. Fauci. Hey, Steph. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Very good. Sorry for the technical difficulties, but uh, I'm glad I got connected with you. And I like that background, too. <laughs> oh, man, I appreciate you coming on. I know you're a busy man. And, uh, and obviously, this time, uh, there's a sense of urgency with everything that you're doing. So, one, I appreciate your commitment to uh, protecting the masses and uh, bringing all your expertise and knowledge of you know, how this virus spreads uh, and informing the people how we should take this seriously. And uh, I just want to thank you for you know, your, your commitment to that uh, because we all know how important um, it is for all of us to be in the know, to, to have the right information, to be able to you know, act accordingly. So uh, thank you for your time you know, hopping on with me. My pleasure. All right, so what we did, I put out the request yesterday. Everybody knew that I was going to be uh, talking to you, so I try to compile as many questions as possible from all of my followers, everybody who uh, wanted to ask you questions directly, and we'll kind of just see how the conversation goes and, and uh, just would love your sound advice. So I'll start with a pretty simple one, I think, but just in terms of you know, how is COVID-19 uh, different from the flu in terms of, you know, how it you know, interacts with the body and just how it spreads? Well, it's similar in some respects, Steph, in that it's a respiratory illness that's transmitted by the respiratory route. Uh, it gives a, 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 a degree of pathology that's mostly pneumonia. Um, the reason it's different is that it's very, very much more transmissible than flu and more importantly, it's significantly more serious. Let me give you some very quick numbers. Okay. The overall mortality of seasonal flu that you and I confront every year is about 0.1%. The overall mortality of coronavirus is about 1%. Sometimes, like in China, it was up to 2 to 3%, which means it's at least 10 times more serious than the typical influenza. So when people kind of compare it, in some respects, it has some similarities, but it's really, really different in its degree of seriousness. And is that, I know I've been hearing a lot of kind of rumors around or numbers around from, you know, when it, when it showed up in China to uh, other different countries, you know, the disparity or discrepancy amongst ages right. and, you know, how it affects uh, obviously, we have underlying uh, underlying health conditions, or you know, if you're uh, a little older, that it affects you a little bit more seriously. But has that shown differently here in the states in terms of you know different age brackets and and uh, just the severity of of how you know the cases of death versus in, in sure. care units and uh, uh, and all those type of things? Yeah, mostly the same, but with some interesting, maybe disturbing differences. If you look at China. You look at Europe, you look at South Korea, it predominantly is reasonably uh, benign, if you want to call it that. You get sick, but you don't get into serious trouble if you're young. Very heavily weighted towards the elderly and those with underlying conditions, heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, kidney disease. Those are the people who have a higher degree of mortality. We know that for sure. We're seeing that a lot now in the United States. But what we are starting to see is that there are some people who are younger, people your age, young, healthy, vigorous, who don't have any underlying conditions, who are getting seriously ill. It's still a very, very small minority. But it doesn't mean that young people like yourself should say, I'm completely exempt from any risk of getting seriously ill. And that's the reason why when we talk about being careful of physical distancing, doing the kind of social separation, it means not only for the elderly, but the young people have to do it too, for two reasons. One, you need to protect yourself because you're not completely exempt from serious illness. But two, you can become the vector or the carrier of infection where you get infected, you feel well, and then you inadvertently and innocently pass it on to your grandfather or your grandmother or your uncle who's on chemotherapy for cancer. That's what we got to be careful of. And that's really one of the reasons that I wanted to have this Q&A and hopefully reach, um, 
you know, a different demographic or people that, you know, are, are interested in, in, in the facts of, of what's going on because you see all the different, uh, you know, visuals of people uh, at the beach, at parks, like in crazy, you know, public gatherings and, and not really uh, adhering to that social distancing kind of concept and, and like the sense of urgency of what you just said of, of how that can uh, continue the spread of the virus, but affect people that unknowingly even uh, in their own families that, uh, that it, it might, you know, show up a little different or, or lead to some, you know, drastic and, and dire situation that they uh, don't want to find themselves or anybody in their family in. That you're absolutely correct. We really do have a responsibility to protect the vulnerable ones. And the vulnerables are the elderly and those with underlying conditions. We've got to make sure they are clearly protected from this, which could be very serious for them. And so, you know, like, uh, I guess probably this, we're on uh, week, going into week three of, uh, since the NBA has uh, uh, been, been shut down in terms of, uh, postponing the season. Uh, obviously, the Olympics uh, just announced, you know, moving to next year uh, to do their part in terms of, you know, keeping large gatherings from happening and, and just being smart and, and precautious. Uh, my question is, like, what needs to happen in terms of, you know, the numbers or what metric are you looking at to be able to then determine uh, – at mass that you know large gatherings sporting events those type of things are okay to you know revisit as as not a threat to uh, continue you know the spread of the virus that's a great question steph and and that's what we deal with on a daily basis when we sit down in the situation room with the white house every day to go over that what you need is you need to see the the trajectory of the curve start to come down we've seen that in china they went up and down they're starting to get back to some normal life. They gotta be careful they don't reintroduce the virus into China, but they're on the other end of the curve. Korea is doing that, they're starting to come back down. Europe, particularly Italy, is in a terrible situation. They're still going way up. The United States is a big country. We have so many different regions, like New York City right now is having a terrible time, and yet there are places in the country that are doing really quite well. You could probably identify people, contact trace and get them out of circulation. Whereas in New York City, it's doing what's called mitigation, trying to spread, as, trying to prevent as best you can the spread. So in direct answer to your question, we could start thinking about getting back to some degree of normality when the country as a whole is turn that corner and start coming down. Then you could pinpoint cases much more easily than getting overwhelmed by cases, which is what's going on in New York City. Part of that, right, in, in terms of testing, so with, like the numbers are going through the roof and, and, and I know I think it just checked, you know, we're in terms of number of cases, I think we're approaching or even maybe close to surpassing Italy. Obviously we're a bigger country, so you have to take that into account, but like testing is, is becoming more accessible than it was three weeks ago. And I think I know that there's different efforts in different parts of the country that are trying to address that issue. I myself, um, I had flu-like symptoms about three weeks ago uh, or two weeks, or sorry, two days before um, the NBA shut down. And I got, a, I got a test, you know, pretty much right away. And I know that there's a conversation now about just the overall accessibility of tests and, um, and, and how those are starting to roll out in different parts of the country. Like, what's your assessment of, of that process? How important is that process, whether you have symptoms or whether you don't? And, uh, and when it comes to dealing with each individual case, like, how, how are we addressing the testing issue? Okay, great question. That's been a real issue. Early on, several weeks ago, we were not in a place where we needed to be or wanted to be. We did not have as much accessibility of testing as we now have and that we will have going forward. Right now, there are literally hundreds of thousands of tests that are out there now, mostly because we got the private sector involved of the companies who know how to make it and make it well, make large amounts. So we're going very much in the right direction. In specific answer to your question, you did the right thing. I mean, if someone right now gets flu-like syndromes, a fever, aches, and a bit of a cough, the first thing you do is stay at home don't go to an emergency room because then you might be infecting others. Okay. Get on the phone with a physician, a nurse, or a healthcare provider. Get instructions from them what to do 
And if available, you can get a test. But the critical issue is don't flood the emergency rooms. Stay at home. If you really are obviously seriously ill, then you've got to go quickly there. But if you just have aches, pains, and a fever, stay where you are, but contact your physician. So if you have those symptoms, right, now we have, this is one of the most popular questions that I received yesterday and, and up until, you know, our interview started where people really want to know, you, if you contract the virus, you quarantine yourself, you go through the recovery process, and then, you, you know, the, the symptoms either wane or sometimes you might not have symptoms and, you, you know, the, the virus kind of passes through. What does it mean to be recovered? And can you get the virus a second time? Um, and in, if yes or no, does that influence, you know, how testing kind of goes uh, in the future in terms of trying to detect an antibody or uh, even address like that conversation around herd immunity and, and how to really not let this be a cyclical thing that, uh, or, is, or is it a cyclical thing in terms of, you know, what to expect in the, in, in, in the future? Okay, Steph, you had three or four or five questions. I know, sorry. I, I, I'm okay, I'll go in. <laughs> Let's we'll, start we'll, with the first one. Can you get the virus a second time? Let's keep okay, it going. Okay, well, but, but, <laughs> but let, me, let me get to the first one, which was also important. All right. So if you're infected and you recover, the question is, when can you go out and be safe to not infect others? The general rule is you have to have two cultures 24 hours apart that are negative. That's okay. what the rule is now. As more people get infected, that likely is not going to be feasible. So we're going to have to set some guidelines of days following the diminution of symptoms. We're not there yet because we don't know as much about how far out you could be shedding virus, first thing. Second thing, your main question, once you get infected, can you get reinfected? We haven't done the specific testing to determine that, but if this acts like every virus, similar to it that we know, the chances are overwhelming that if you get infected, recover from infection, that you are not gonna get infected with the same virus, which okay. means that you can then safely go out into the community and feel immune so that you could not only protect yourself, get back to work, get back to your job, but you'll be able to have what you refer to as herd immunity. Enough people who've recovered in the community, that gives the virus very little chance to spread rapidly. That's what's referred to as herd immunity. Okay. In, in terms of the timeline that we're in right now, um, I heard this, uh, this, I guess, rumor or and or belief that kind of with like the flu that in warmer weather or warmer months through over the summer that that diminishes the ability for the, uh, for the virus to spread or to act as it's doing right now. Is there any truth to that? Well, with other viruses like seasonal influenza that we, we get confronted with every year and other coronaviruses, that are more benign, typical common cold. What you said is true. As the weather gets warmer, viruses tend to do poorly in warm, moist weather and do quite well in cold, dry weather. And that's one of the reasons why, in addition to the fact that in the warm weather, you're more outside and not confined in a room, that these kind of respiratory viruses tend to go down as you get into the summer months. The only issue is, Steph, we don't know whether this is gonna happen with this virus because this is the first time we've ever dealt with this virus. So it's not an unreasonable assumption to think that it's gonna go down, but you don't wanna count on it. Right. That's what I'm just thinking about from the general population standpoint in terms of how important you know that social distancing effort is. Um, obviously there's people that are in tough situations having to make tough decisions trying to earn you know, their income, whether they're in the, the essential services category in their industry and they, they need to go to work, um, those type of things. Like, what's the risk of lifting those, each, you know, each city, each state is kind of dealing with that on a case, you know, by case basis. But what is the, the serious risk of lifting those uh, social distancing or shelter in place or stay at home initiatives too early? Um, and that balance of where we're at with, you know, shutting down the entire economy. Well, you know, Steph, it, it, it is not an all or none process. I mean, when you're locking down the way they, the way Governor Newsom did in California and the way Governor Cuomo's doing in New York City, 
That's the extreme. That's a heavy hammer on something. Even if you uh, kind of lessen those restrictions, everybody until this is over should, should practice some degree of physical distancing and care. Not big crowds, wash your hands a lot, be careful. You can do that and still get back to somewhat of a normal life. There's a big difference between the extreme of locking a city down, right. opening it up a bit, but being more careful than you normally would be. And I think there are places in the country now where you want to look at carefully and say, you know, maybe you want to pull back a little bit on the restriction so long as you just don't let it rip and say, I don't care what happens. So right. you treat New York City a little bit different the way you treat Nebraska. That's kind of in the, in the spirit of what America is in terms of we're not overreacting, right? That's, that's the, I've heard that term in terms of, you know, people uh, feeling, you know, threatened by the, the, the change in the reality. But there's no overreaction to this. This is a serious thing. You're absolutely right. We need to make that point. This is serious business. We are not overreacting. Um, can I go back to testing right quick? Because I'm, I'm sure. watching some of the, uh, the comments come in as we go. Um, in terms of, like, just specifics on like the access to testing, um, like currently, just why I guess is it so challenging to get a test if you know you do have the symptoms or to your point earlier about you know they're they're at a level where you feel like you need you know medical attention immediately versus you know your common you know flu-like symptoms. But if you want to go get a test, like what are the things that are in inhibiting those being accessible to to the masses? Well. There should be nothing now that's inhibiting it, but originally the system, the way it was set up, Steph, was not geared to this kind of massive capability of instantaneously, safely getting a test, getting it done in a really good period of time. Not days and days, but hours. Right now the system is changed predominantly because it's being handed over to the commercial firms who know how to do it. Okay. It starts off as a public health measure from the CDC. It now needs to be and is being handed over to the commercial group. And so you're, forgive my ignorance in terms of like you're testing, the test to understand if you have the virus or not, um, and that that's being rolled out. Is there a, another process of tests that are um being developed to test the ant like the development of antibodies and and so yeah. we know if you've gone through the process or not sure. like you say you built up that immunity that you can start to understand the numbers of how many people have gone through that to, to get back to kind of normal life quicker uh, steph that's not a stupid question that's a smart question <laughs> <laughs> because that's exactly what we are doing and what you need to do there's two types of tests and you described it as well as anybody one to determine if you are actually now infected. That's the test that people need to get screened. Another test determines if at some time you were infected. It's an antibody test. It's much quicker, it's much easier, it's much cheaper. Those are the kind of tests where you can determine out there how many people actually did get infected and recovered. A very important piece of information that we need to get. And on that, I know there's a timeline for uh, developing a vaccine, right? And that, that, I know there's certain tests and, and, uh, and trials have started uh, in different areas, but I heard it's a 12 to 18 month timeline really to be able to even roll that out in any, in any kind of form. But uh, what does that, what does that uh, process look like? And what is the likelihood that we get to um, a success in, in, in a vaccine in that time? And how does that affect, I guess, the follow-up with how that would affect the cyclical nature and possibly of, of the corona? Okay, another great question. Well, the vaccine development, we have started on the development of vaccine faster than ever in the history of any virus. From the time it was discovered to the time we actually made it and put it into a, into a trial. But when you test the vaccine, it's multiple phases. The first thing you gotta do is make sure it's safe. We started that a couple of weeks ago. When you find out it's safe and that it induces the kind of response you want it to, then you do it in a lot of people. The first right. safe trial to be careful is like 45 people. Then you go into hundreds, if not thousands of people, 
in what's called the phase two, three trial to determine if it works. That's the thing that's going to take an additional eight months or so. So when you add up the three or four months for the phase one, plus the seven or eight months, you get about a year to a year and a half. If we really push, we hope that we will know by the time we get into next winter whether or not we have something that works. A vaccine is going to be totally relevant for if it cycles into another season, which that, quite frankly, I think it's going to do. Right. This virus is very, very transmissible, and we're seeing it throughout the world. I cannot imagine it's just going to disappear. So vaccines are going to be important for the next time around, not for what we're dealing with now. So on that front, like right now we're um, dealing with the first wave, right? So uh, I, I, there's a potential, I, I, in terms of what you just said, that there could be multiple periods of, you know, whether it's New York, whether it's California, and you're kind of tracking, you know, where the the hot spots are, but. Uh, that there could be more uh, responsibility for social distancing or shelter in place or different uh, in directions that, you know, gov uh, cities and states are taking right now that could happen, you know, down the road uh, next, next flu or next season, I should say. That could be a possibility, right? You know, Steph, it's a possibility, but I think and I hope, and it's not just hope because I think if we do it right, it will happen this way, that we will get enough experience so that when it does come back, mm -hmm. we'll be able to immediately identify, isolate, and contact trace. And if you do that effectively, you don't have an outbreak. You contain it at a very low level, which would mean we won't have to lock down again. We could treat individual ones and prevent the outbreak, prevent what we're seeing in New York City, prevent what we're starting to see right now in, Los, in the New Orleans. Those are the kind of things that if we go around that cycle, I think we can avoid that. We'll be much different than what we're doing right now. Absolutely. Um, so in terms of uh, masks, right? So there's a conversation around uh, the N95 respirator mask or your, your kind of standard surgical mask or um, whether you're sick or healthy, whether you should wear one or not, if you're, you know, going out in public or, um, can you speak on just the effectiveness of, you know, masks in this, in this kind of, uh, to address the problem, you know, and how that the access to those N95 masks around the country, like, uh, are we in short supply? We need more, like, how's that process going? Okay. We certainly need more. We have much more supply now than we had just literally a week or two ago. You have to prioritize who needs the mask and who should wear it. Okay. First and foremost, healthcare providers, doctors, nurses, and health providers who are taking care of a person with coronavirus disease to protect them from getting infected. Because what's happened in Italy and what happened in, in uh, China is you can knock out your healthcare force and then you're really in trouble. So protect the person. The other one is if you are infected, to put a mask on to prevent you from spreading it to someone else. The third priority is the general population, who if they wear a mask, they may assume that it's 100% protected. It's just not. It's probably, you can guess a number, maybe 50%. So when we say you don't need to wear a mask, what we're really saying is that make sure you prioritize it first to the people who need the mask. In a perfect world, if you had all the masks you wanted, then somebody walking in the street with a mask doesn't bother me. You can get some degree of protection. But make sure you prioritize it well. And uh, I was just thinking about like all the different you know ways to address that issue. Obviously, there's uh, you know the, the federal government down to you know your state governments trying to. I heard that a lot of uh, state governments are having to go buy them on their own and try to, you know, supply those to, like you said, where, uh, where it's needed. Um, are we, are we going about that the right way in terms of, you know, that process and, and getting that access and, and just, yeah, you know, there, there's a stock we don't pile. Have a lot of visibility. Yeah. You know, step, there's a stockpile of, you know, tens and tens of millions of masks, but you know, we live in a country that we can do things pretty efficiently. Once you get the private sector, these companies involved, they could whip out millions and millions of masks. So 
I mean, literally at the last meeting we had, say, okay, enough is enough. Let's get them and flood it. Let's get those companies to make them. And they're willing to do it. You know, it's very interesting. You would think that the federal government would almost have to force them to do it. Right. We're not seeing that. We're seeing they're stepping forward, wanting to do it themselves. I appreciate that. Um, just from your vantage point, you've been front and center uh, from the start, again, spreading, you know, p accurate, truthful information and trying to, uh, I know things change on the daily and, 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 uh, and you're following that, that trend, but what's the biggest piece of, I guess, misinformation and that, that, you know, uh, that's kind of been out and, you know, for public consumption and what would you kind of say to, uh, to correct that, that, that whatever issue that, that is. You know, I think you brought it up in one of the questions that you asked me. This dichotomy between people who are being frightened to death of it versus people who don't even believe it and think it's something trivial that you don't have to worry about. I'd like to get the people in the country to realize that we are dealing with a serious problem. It's something that we've modified our lives. It's not convenient to lock yourself in. It's not convenient to not do the kinds of things. It's not convenient for you not to be playing basketball. But we're going through a period of time now where we've got to, as a country, pull together, don't get frightened, don't get intimidated, use the energy to be able to confront it and do the kinds of things that'll put an end to it. So I want to get rid of that misconception that there's extremes. Either the world is going to end or we don't want to do anything. It isn't that. It's somewhere in the middle. I appreciate it. I think that's what we all needed to hear. It's what, you know, the reason I wanted to do this and, and be able to have this face time with you just because uh, from when anybody's life is interrupted and whether you've been affected personally by COVID or not uh, from somebody contracting the virus or, um, or, or what have you, that level of comfort that what we're doing is, you know, what we're doing is uh, in the right spirit of trying to stop the spread as fast as possible, return people to their normal lives. But, you know, taking this seriously and, and understand that there is a strategy to doing that and that we all kind of have to adhere to it. So just in that, in that respect, like where would you send, you know, your everyday person to uh, find that information if we can't get on an IG live and, and ask these questions, like where would you send them to, uh, to stay in the know. Yeah, well, there's, there's a couple of websites. There's one called coronavirus.gov. It's part of the CDC website. You could either go into cdc.gov and get into it or go right to coronavirus.gov. All the information you want is right there. Perfect. We're going to save this, uh, this Q&A and, and hopefully people can go back to it and... Uh and get all that pertinent information. I appreciate you so much for uh, being available and being selfless enough to, to uh, have this conversation with me. And uh, thank you again for you and your entire team uh, protecting, protecting all of us. And uh, can't thank you enough. Thank you very much, Steph. It's a pleasure being with you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to be with you. Absolutely. All the best. Thank you. Make sure I get it right. All right.